So Father, we come today as your church, your sons and your daughters. And Lord, we come, Lord, not to just sing some songs, but I here to hear some guy talk. Father, but why we have come is so that we can experience God together. And Lord, we're not here to offer you our words, our voices, as good or as bad as they are. Lord, we're here to offer you our hearts. And may it always be. May we never come to experience you without bringing our hearts. Father, today as we've been singing, it's an opportunity for us to have brought our heart, a heart of worship. Not because we think you're really great, but because you're you're truly our savior, our rescuer, the one who has offered us forgiveness, though we do not deserve it, healing to a wound that we cannot stop from bleeding. Lord, you're the one who offers us hope. You're the one who offers us a path that is so different than the one that we have chosen. Lord, you are the one. And no matter how long it's been since we joined your path, Lord, I pray that every time I would come before you, that I would bring my heart of gratitude with me, and that's what I would offer. So today, Father, as your sons and your daughters, we bring you our hearts of worship, with gratitude as our motivation. We pray that you would receive them with the willing hearts that they are given. Lord, I pray that this would be a joyful song <laughs> to your heart. In Jesus' mighty name, if we agree with the prayer, can we say amen? amen. Let's give God applause because I believe he deserves it. He is worthy of it. He is worthy of it. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and find a seat? Well, we're starting a brand new series today. It's called The Stories That Remain. The Stories That Remain. It's the study of the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to see Jesus in this gospel interacting. And each one of these scenes are monumental. They're so, so critically important for us. And there's a reason that they are written. So we're going to investigate these each and every week. I've been waiting to do this series probably, I don't know, probably two years. But the timing was just not right. But I do feel like now is the right timing for us to dive into this. Some years ago, I remember sitting with my friend. His name was George, George Cuff. And George, if you're listening, if you ever get word of this, just say, I just want you to know I am grateful to you, my friend, grateful for you. I have no idea where he is in the world today. But George Cuff was my friend. And I said, George, there's this young lady. Her name is Rebecca Stormont. And I'm just wondering, tell me everything you know. I want to know everything about this young lady. I've been seeing her and I wonder what is she really like? I know you know her and you know people who know her really well. You know her sisters. I want to know everything you know. And so George began to share with me what he knew. He began to share with me with certainty about the young lady that he knew to be Rebecca. And he was telling me things that he knew about, but then there were some things he didn't know about. So I said, well, hey, I want you to go talk to her sister and I want you to ask her that question. Or so-and-so is her best friend, and I want you to go talk to her. I want you to ask her that question, because I want to know the answers to these questions. What was George doing for me? George was helping me understand some certainty, some with accuracy, about this young lady, Rebecca. And those stories, real stories would draw me in closer to say, I want to investigate even more. I want to know even more about this girl so that I would get to know her. And eventually, it would lead to a place where I would put my faith in her to ask her hand in marriage. All of that started with stories. These stories of eyewitness accounts from George, her sisters, and all the other people that know her. Ultimately, ultimately, there was truth that I understood about her. I was certain about who she was. But at some point, 
to walk at her side for the rest of my life was going to mean I'd have to place my faith in who she was. And that relationship would be with me for the rest of my life. Well, what we're talking about with the Gospel of Luke is something actually quite similar. You see, Luke is doing this for his friend, Theophilus. You see, Theophilus, and we'll explain this in a minute, but he's in a position where he really needs to know with certainty what's going on with Jesus. And he has questions. He's got really good questions about Jesus. Who is he? What is he all about? I've heard stories, but I want to know what are the accurate stories? What with certainty can I be sure of? What did he actually say about himself? What did he say that he wanted from me? What did he say he wanted for me? How does he speak on behalf of the Father? I'm still trying to figure this out. How is it that the Holy Spirit is involved in this in the presence of God himself? I need to understand all of it. And I need to understand why did it end with the cross? Why did it begin again with the resurrection? Luke, I got some questions. And I know that you know, because Luke himself was someone who knew Jesus. And so what did Luke do? He went and he started talking. He started talking to people that he knew were eyewitnesses themselves of the life that Jesus had led. He talked about his own experiences that he uh, was able to uh, experience with Jesus. He's, that's going to be reflected in his gospel But he's digging into now the eyewitnesses who heard Jesus speak. I just, can you imagine what would have been like for Luke to do the research on forming this gospel? As he's sitting down with all of these different people and you wonder, well, who are these people? They're the people whose stories are being shared in the gospel of Luke. He's sitting there talking to people who at however long Uh, after the resurrection of Jesus, that they're still talking about Jesus. And they're like, oh yeah, I want to share my story. In fact, I remember I was there in the Sermon on the Mount. I remember when Jesus was speaking, I could still hear him. His words are still burning in my heart. And I remember hearing him teach. And I remember my faith just being drawn out of me And I began to experience a peace that I had searched for all of my life. And I never had experienced it, but I did with him. And it was only the beginning of that. There was a moment when I truly understood that I was forgiven. And it was truly over. And I could lay aside this guilt and the shame that I had carried with me for so long. Or others who would come to him and say, It was Jesus. I remember the day. I remember the moment. I remember what the sun felt like as Jesus literally reached out and touched me and my body was healed. My mind was healed. My heart was healed. And the bleeding of my life finally stopped and the healing began. Oh, I want to tell you all about it. And that's exactly what Luke was doing. He's writing down these stories. And he's sharing them with us. And not only the eyewitnesses, but then he's going to the the disciples, the apostles themselves and saying, tell me, help me understand. Read through this. You were here for all of it. You tell me. I want this to be absolutely accurate because my friend Theophilus deserves that. Makes me wonder of how much effort we put in to making sure that our friends and our family are certain of what we know what they should know about Jesus. And as he's meeting with the disciples, the apostles, they're literally able to then check the stories and say, that's exactly how it was, or make a correction and say, well, it was this way, but a little bit different this way, and bring it in so that it was the truly inspired of the Holy Spirit. And it was an accurate, as he will say, Luke, an accurate representation, an accurate authentic authentic document of the life and the teachings of Jesus. This is what he is doing for his friend Theophilus. You see, certainty of the truth is important and it's absolutely crucial. It's what he's going to give him, but it's still going to require faith on the part of Theophilus. And he knows it. And so he's going to draw these stories out and he's writing the gospel in a way that will draw that out. So no matter how accurate the truth, embracing the way of Jesus is still going to require Theophilus' faith. 
Let's look at the, let's look at verse one, chapter one. Here's what it says. Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. And they use the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples, the eyewitnesses, the apostles themselves. And having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you could be certain of the truth of everything that you were taught. A couple of things about this passage that are important. Next slide. The thing we want to look at here is that Luke is a doctor by training. We know this because that's what the New Testament will teach us about him. And we also know that because the words that are found in the gospel, uh, there's a number of words that were used in the medical field. And so we know Luke is the author. We know he's a doctor by training. He was also a companion of Paul on his journeys. He was with Paul as Paul was being imprisoned in Rome to stand trial on because he wouldn't stop talking about Jesus in the Roman Empire. So he's gonna have to go meet with Caesar to talk about this. Well, Luke was one of his companions. He wasn't in prison with him, but he was someone who was helping him, an aid. He, Paul was allowed to see people during his imprisonment, and so Luke could make that happen, and he was able to help him from the outside. And so we know this. We know that a scroll this size was extremely costly to even get the materials for. We know that it would have taken months at the, at the soonest and likely a few years to write, depending on how much time he actually had to invest in it and how quickly he could go through these eyewitness accounts and the stories and then check and recheck and rewrite and all of that going through that process. We know that it would have been put together in that kind of a way. We also know that this person that it's written to, Theophilus, we know that Theophilus is a Roman official of high rank. We don't know exactly what his rank was, but we know that when he says most honorable Theophilus, this is actually a title. This is not just sucking up. Luke's not sucking up to Theophilus. He's actually using a title that Theophilus would have uh, had. And so he calls him most honorable. We see this happening in the book of Acts with Felix, who was a governor. And he was also, he also had this title of, of most honorable. So we know that it was a, a, a big deal. And we also know why he wrote it. He says it right here in the text, so that you can be certain. Oh, Theophilus, I don't want you to have any questions. I want you to be certain of the truth. And it made me think, as I was studying and preparing for this, you know, I don't know about you. I'm sure you never, ever do this, but I do it. You know, I'll complain about people with titles in our nation. I mean, anybody else? Anybody else do this? See, I told you, nobody, nobody else does it. It's just me. But see, I do this. I do this. And, and I really, honestly, I had the thought, how often do I pray for these peoples? How, how often do I pray for them rather than just complain about them? So, so I came up with a, with a, with a formula. Uh, again, this isn't for you. It's for me. For every complaint, I think I need to offer two prayers. So when I complain, I need to offer two prayers to, to really make some ground up on this. Is this making sense to anybody? Again, I know it's probably not you, but there might be three people in here. They're like, yeah, I can. how many think that's a, probably a good idea? I'm going to complain about that person not seeing the will of God, not seeing sanity, lacking wisdom on pretty much every front, whatever government official you want to attach this to. How about offering some prayers on top of that so that they will literally see what God sees and that they'll hear what God hears? Because here's why I absolutely know that the enemy of our soul is the enemy of their soul and he's done his absolute best to cover their minds, cover their lives strategically and put people around them that will not allow them to see the truth, the very truth that they need to see so that they can exercise the God-given authority that has been placed in their hands. And I need them to see it. When was the last time we prayed for anybody with a title? I think it'd be a good thing for the church to be doing this. In fact, it's actually commanded that we would do exactly that for those of rank. I think it's a good idea for us. Now, when you go on in chapter one, past this section of scripture, this passage, you're gonna see the story of the birth of Jesus. It's Christmas time. Everybody say Christmas time. 
So chapter one, chapter two, Christmas time. And so we're not going to dive deep into those stories because truthfully, we just did that at Christmas time <laughs> just a couple of months ago. But it does need to be said that when Theophilus read through those stories, that's just some things that he needed to learn. There was a reason that Luke brought those stories out. It wasn't just because he wanted to, you know, have a nice little cuddly moment. No, it wasn't trying to create some hallmark stories like, oh, it's really sweet. There was snow, a baby. He's trying to tell him the real story about what was going on. The miraculous, the miraculous intervention of the kingdom of God and of the kingdom of earth, that's what it was all about. And so he needed him to know that God in his mercy actually had a plan. You see, God, God has always had a plan and God's working his plan. And the plan, well, we have to see it unfold right before our eyes in chapter one and chapter two. He had a plan. The father sent his son, Jesus, to be with you for the rescue, for the redemption and for the healing. And this is when we get to see it. And that's what this is all about. And so we get to know that. We know that the arrival is miraculous because anytime the kingdom of God enters our kingdom, it's miraculous. Yes? Yes. Did you know that you get to pray every single day because Jesus told us to pray that the kingdom of God would come and that his will would be done in your life? Do you know that each time that you say yes to God, you're allowing the miraculous into your life? That the kingdom of God is literally invading the kingdom of this world in a really good way? So this is the the open process that we get to see happening right before us. And so it's brought about also by deeply committed women and men who said yes to God, whose hearts were given to him. And they said, whatever it is you wanna do with my life, you get to do it. So God's looking for people in order to do miraculous, incredible things where the kingdom of God comes into this earth, breaks through, breaks into, and he's looking for people's hearts to do it through. He found them, and we learn about them. Chapter one and chapter two. That would be Mary, Joseph. That would be Zechariah and Elizabeth when it comes to the other miracle child of John the Baptist. We'll talk about him in a moment. But he makes, he makes the print in chapter one because he's a very important part of the story. And so when we recognize that this was all going on, we recognize that there were people who were available. And I wonder, are we available? They were available in their time, their city, their generation. God used me. And I just wonder, is that really what we want? Are we making ourselves available for that? Because it's easy to think this life is all about this and that and career and education. And it's all about the little fun things to distract me. It's all about making the money. It's all about a lot of things. You can make a very long list of what we think it's about. God says, well, I'll tell you what it's about for me. It's about bringing the kingdom of God into your life, seeing it transformed, and then allowing that transformation to shine brightly into the lives of other people. Because as good as all those things are on that list, nothing compares. Nothing compares to what I want to give because this is truly a redemption story. This is truly a rescue story, truly a rescue story. And so it's made possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. The presence of the Holy Spirit is coming and we start learning about that here in the first chapters of Luke. Then we move on. Next, next set of verses. It was now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, the Roman emperor, Pontius Pilate was the governor over Judea. Herod Antipas was ruler over Galilee. His brother Philip was ruler over Ituria and Trachonitis. Uh, if you're ever wondering like, man, how does he know how to pronounce these? I don't. I'm just saying them really confidently. Lysanias, everybody say Lysanias. You're a Greek scholar. Next time somebody's like, I don't know how smart you are. Just rip this out. Chapter three, you go, Lysanias. They're like, whoa, I had no idea you were that learned about scripture. Oh yeah, Lysanias was ruler over Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. What is he doing? Why do these names matter? I'll tell you why they matter. They absolutely matter. Because for Theophilus, who was somewhere ruling in the Roman government, some sort of height of authority that was pretty significant, this is longitude and latitude. 
These are coordinates that would pinpoint him to the time and the date. Because Luke has nothing to hide. You see, he's not telling a vague story through the gospel of Luke. The story of Jesus is not a vague story. Well, this guy kind of went to this place. It was sort of around this time. And he did some things. I learned nothing. He's literally talking about people that Theophilus would have known. Either he knew them personally or he knew them by reputation. He knows the time. He knows the days that this is describing. This is time and date that he has just given to Theophilus because what is his goal? His goal is I want Theophilus to be certain the things that I'm teaching him, that he can know about Jesus. That's why it's so critically important I share this. And so then he goes on and he says, at this time, at this date, latitude, longitude, this very geography, at this time, a message from God came to John, son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. Now we're going back to chapter one, where this miraculous story of John, John who will eventually become known as the Baptist, We're going to learn about him next week in week two. John was a miraculous story as well because his mom and dad, Zechariah and Elizabeth are, let's just say they are cranking old. We don't know how old, we just know they're cranking old. They're so old, there's no way, can't ever have children, but baby came and here it is. His name is John. He is a miraculous happening where the kingdom of God breaks into this earthly kingdom and they are overjoyed by it. And this is who they're talking about. He's a miracle as well. Why? Because everything Jesus does is a miracle. Because he is the kingdom of God who literally broke into this world and lived among us. And then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River. He was living in the wilderness because he was meant to be seen as this Old Testament prophet so that people would go out to him and they would hear him speak on behalf of God. He was preaching in and around the Jordan, preaching that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. Now, this idea of baptism is actually new to them. It's not new in the sense that they've never heard of it. It's new, but they've never applied it in this way. You see, baptism simply means washings. Now, washings was always part of the worship of God. And so this is pretty common but they had never applied it in this way where people were literally coming out of the wilderness and then they were being baptized in the way that we understand it, that we see it today and that we are told to follow suit. But they knew exactly what it meant because it meant what it always meant. That I'm going to wash so that I am clean before the Lord so that there's not a blemish, there's not dirt, there's not a spot, there's not a wrinkle. I wanna present myself completely clean, (coughs) physically representing the cleanliness that's going on in the inside. And then I will offer my sacrifice to the Lord. This is what they were doing, this is what it meant for them. And it's really important we understand that because what God's saying at this point is let's clean this mess up. You guys have made a mess of your life. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, he's talking to you. Go ahead. All right, now I want you to turn to your other neighbor and you need to say it to them. That's good. You guys are calling each other out. I love it. Let's clean this mess up. Here's the reason why this is important. If you and I do not have an accurate understanding of who we are and the mess that is our life, And all of us have a mess to clean up today. You're like, I don't know about that. I'll prove it in a minute. (laughs) You're proving it right now with the list you're making. If you don't have an accurate understanding of who you are, how on earth do you think you could ever have an accurate understanding of the rescue? How do you think you'd ever have an accurate understanding of what this rescue that's happening in your life is really all about? See, the rescue isn't much of a rescue. It's more of just kind of an invitation. Hey, let's go on a trip. It's a rescue. It's an absolute rescue story. And for us not to understand the mess that is our life that God himself has to get involved in where the kingdom of God literally has to intervene in order to clean this mess up. 
If I don't understand that, then I am not going to allow God to do that work. I'm just gonna pass on it and say it's not that big of a deal and that would be to my own detriment because I need to understand that I am a restoration project. Craig, I am still a restoration project and so are you. That's why Jesus said, when they asked him, hey, how do we pray? Can you teach us how to pray? And he teaches us how to pray. Our Father in heaven, he goes through the whole thing. How does he end it? He said, oh God, keep me from temptation today. The rescue is on today. Because if it's not for you, I'm just gonna keep making a bigger mess. And it's time to clean this mess up. And that's my intention, that's your intention. And so we move on. This is the work of God. I think about uh, 16 years ago, we bought our house. So when we bought our house, we visited a number of houses. If you've ever bought a house and you know what this is like, you just kind of go into these houses and you just start finding the things that you really like. Well, I walked through the front doors, I saw the back windows in our house and I said, this is it. I was in love with this house, which is not good. Because when you fall in love with a house that early, you pretty much are willing to just take it at whatever price and in whatever condition. And that's pretty much where I was at. I'm really bad about this, which is why my wife is very good because she is a restraining effect on me as we, as we talk about this. So anyway, uh, as we bought this, we're, we're looking at this house and we're, we're thinking, all right, we, we really think we wanna settle on this house. And so in order to buy this house, we needed to go through a home inspection, right? And by the way, you get what you pay for. If you, you paid for a cruddy home inspection, you're probably gonna get a cruddy home report and you're gonna find out about you know, your broken foundation a couple years later when you got water seeping up. Anyway, that's all I'm gonna say. But we paid for a good one. And so I'm thinking, what are they gonna find? I mean, I've looked the place over, not really all that accurately, but I've looked it over, it looks really great to me. And I'm thinking I'm gonna get a one page list. No, 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 I got a three ring binder notebook of what the inspector found. And I'm thinking already when he hands it to me, I'm going, that's okay, I don't care what's in this book, I want this house. I am happy with this house, I love this house. Nothing in this notebook could be that bad. It's all good. And so we started opening it up and realizing, yeah, there's no broken foundation here, but there are a few things that my wife was pointing out that I probably should have looked at a little stronger. And so we said, you know what? It is time that we bother the sellers and we do need to ask them to fix this because they're hoping that we wouldn't because they don't want to spend any more money on it than they have to. And I get it, but I don't want to buy their problems. I want them to take care of their own problems and then I will buy a house that's problem solved. And so we're walking through that process. And, and here's the thing. If I'm not willing to go through that process, I'm willing to just take all those problems. But here is the problem with accepting all those problems. All those smaller problems tend to become bigger problems down the line. If I don't have an accurate assessment of that house, I love this house. And I can love this house to my own detriment. I need to listen with accuracy about what's wrong with this house. And I need to put my faith in the inspector and walk through the process. A few years ago, we had to put a new roof on that house. And so I'm thinking, how bad could it be? We don't have any leaks yet. It's probably all good, but it is kind of old, so we're gonna need to replace it. So we send the roofer up, and sure enough, they take pictures and they're talking to us. They come down, they're like, okay, so uh, yeah, a lot of it looks good, but I wanna show you this. I kid you not, there was a family of raccoons nesting in one of our eaves. It was right above our family room. And I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, oh my word, it looks like a frat house. I mean, they've got like this nasty couch in there. There's like soda cans that are empty thrown around, popcorn buckets. They're like watching TV with us every night. This family of raccoons has been living up there how long? I don't know. It's like a hillbilly hotel up there and they're just hanging out. Who knows how long they've been there. And I would have never known unless I sent the inspector up. And when they came down with an accurate assessment, I shouldn't say, oh, they're cute. Let's just let them stay. No, no, you got to take care of it. Because right now it's a nasty frat house. Coming soon, that's going to be a big gaping hole. 
I'm going to have water pouring down into my living room. We've got to take care of this smaller problem right now so it doesn't become a bigger one. If I don't have an accurate assessment of me and my mess, then I will never have an accurate assessment of truly the work of God that he wants to do in my life. Is this making sense to us, church? And this is, this is what we're learning here. This is what Luke is, is teaching us here. And it's important that we learn the lesson. It's important that we hear him. And Theophilus is hearing this for the first time and understanding that, wow, there's a work that God really wants to do. And too often when God, the inspector, puts his finger on a problem and he shows me the notebook, three ring binder full of stuff that are problems and saying, it looks small right now, but it's gonna turn big. I need you to take care of this. In fact, I need you to let me take care of this because I didn't do any of the work, but I allowed the work to be done. I had to commission the work to get done. And whatever I needed to do to be a part of it, then I needed to be a part of it. I need to allow the inspector to do his work and I need to believe him. And when God points out a problem or a sin, three little letters that are pretty small word, what it really means is those things in our life that offend the heart of God. Things that I do, that offend the heart of God, things that I don't do, that offend the heart of God. God points it out and he wants us to to do something about it. And the problem is, is if I'm not willing to take that seriously, I'm honestly looking in the eye, the creator of the universe, the one who breathed life into me. And I'm saying, I disagree with your assessment. It's a small thing. I'm not gonna worry about it. I'm gonna push it off to the side. The raccoons get to stay. (laughs) We all know that would be a ridiculous story, but unfortunately, I can love my house too much to my own detriment. Certainty of the truth still requires my faith. I still have to engage my faith. Faith, the home inspector knows this stuff. Isaiah 55, six, I love this verse. It comes to mind for me. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he's near. Now the truth is we know he's always near, but I'm not always in a place where I can recognize him. I'm not always in a place where I'm willing to recognize his presence and listen to his voice and give my ear to his attention and, and, and posture my heart in a way that him and I can interact, interact about the house report. So I've got an honest question for each one of us. I've been wrestling with it throughout the week. Have you hardened your heart to God's voice? Have you hardened your heart to God's voice? It's an honest question. And when God speaks to you, just know that it might be about cleaning up some of the mess. So let's just do it. Let's just allow him to do it. Because on the other side of that, something called freedom. And isn't freedom a good thing? Oh, now I want you to look at your neighbor and I want you to say freedom. You need to say it a little more enthusiastically. Look at your other neighbor and say freedom. That's what's on the other side of the mess. So then it goes on. Isaiah had spoken of John. This is what the verses say. Isaiah spoke of John, the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament, spoke of John when he said, he is a voice shouting in the wilderness. Now this is hundreds of years before this actually takes place. But the prophet Isaiah prophesied that John would come. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. You notice all these exclamation marks? It's because I need those in my life. Because see, I I get engaged in conversations. I I get engaged with the distractions that are my life. The good things that keep me from the great things. The things of the kingdom that are being held at bay because I really, really want to embrace more of the kingdom of this earth. I get distracted by those things. And so I need someone to say, hey, clear the road. 
Craig, whatever conversation you're in right now, it doesn't matter. I don't care who it is. There's not a conversation going on in your life on this planet that should cause you to miss the coming of the Lord. He's about to arrive. I don't want you to miss any of it. I don't want you to miss him because when he comes, he is literally the key to everything good being unlocked in your life. And so he's saying, clear the road. You got your, your janky donkey cart over here. Get it out of the road. The father is coming and I don't want you missing it. And then he goes on, the valleys will be filled. So in other words, they're filling them up. So there's no depression. The mountains and the hills are gonna be made level. They're being brought down low. So everything's level now. And the curves will be straightened. In other words, you're not gonna lose him on the road as you're following him because he's gonna take a hard right or a hard left and then you're gonna, you're gonna miss him completely. That's not gonna happen. No, 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 he's doing everything he needs to in order to stay in your view so that with absolute clarity, you will know what he's doing, where he's going and when he does it. Because the call that Jesus gave to us was what? Follow me. And for following Jesus, he doesn't want to make it hard. He's not trying to run ahead, <laughs> try to get away from us. Oh, I'm going to hide behind this tree. They're not going to see me. That's not what's going on. He's like, no, no, no. I literally filled in the valleys. I made the mountains and the hills level so that your view would never be obstructed. That's what that means. So clear out of the road because you don't want to be the one who is going to cause someone to miss him, to be in the way, to obstruct someone else's view of what the Father is doing. And the rough place is made smooth, which means he's going to fill in all those potholes that you and I are having to drive through. And then all the people will see the salvation sent from God. Oh, I love that. No one is going to get in the way of seeing him if you want to see him. And what is he coming with? He's coming with the rescue. You know, honestly, I was thinking about this. Who, who pushes the snooze button when the rescuer says, hey, it's time to go? Who, who puts the hand up and says, hold on, I want to finish this conversation? Who, who's going to push the pause button and say, oh, I'll just put it on pause. I got some things I want to do first. Who does that? Who ignores the rescuer when he points out the grenade I'm hoping that it, or that I'm holding towards my, on my chest that is bitterness or unforgiveness or, or, or lust or envy or jealousy or you can fill in the blank, but it's a grenade that's about to go off in my life and the rescuer points it out. Who ignores him? I'll tell you who ignores him. I do. I ignore him. I ignore him because I forget what's going on every day. There's a rescue that's happening. And when I don't realize there's a rescue, I don't take it nearly as seriously as I should when the voice of the Holy Spirit speaks to me. Again, you've never done this. You never would. No, any of you on the online campus, you, you never would do this. But I would. And I do. It's why that voice in the wilderness has to be so loud and so constant. And I love, I love that when, when John's pulling the people out into the, the, the countryside, he has some words for them. He has some words for them. Here, here's what he says. When the crowds came to John for baptism, he said, you, now just think about this. If you showed up at church today and this is how you were greeted, Pastor Tim and Jessica, so sweet earlier. Well, what if they got up and this is what they said, you brood of snakes. Who warned you of the coming wrath? What are you doing here? <laughs> wow, this is gonna be a great service. Really encouraging. <laughs> I'll tell you what John was doing. John was saying, hey, don't you dare come out here to the wilderness and dip into the, 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 the baptism waters of the Jordan River. Don't you dare come out here and just go through the motions. If you're gonna come out here and you're gonna go into these waters, then you need to know it is time to clean up the mess. 
And the rescue that happens today is a rescue God is gonna finish and he's gonna continue it for the rest of your life and he's gonna keep cleaning up the mess. And as long as you listen to him every day, the mess is always gonna remain small. But if you don't let him clean the mess up, that mess is only going to grow like a teenager's bedroom. (laughs) Nasty clothes on the floor. Everybody's wondering, where are all the dishes? They're in their room. <laughs> you know what I'm talking, anybody? No, not my teenagers, that, no, I don't mean that. I've just heard stories about yours. <laughs> so he says, you're gonna come out here, you better prove by the way that you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. In other words, done a 180 and you're walking away from all of that. You're leaving it all in the Jordan River. You're not taking it with you. Don't you dare say to each other, we're safe. We're the descendants of Abraham. We're good to go. I got my golden kick ticket. I'm a Jew. I'm a chosen. John says, uh, no. You, you, you were chosen to embrace the light of God, to be transformed by it, and then to give that light to all the nations as a witness to the rest of this, your generation. And by the way, you did neither of those. So who do you think you are? I'll tell you who you are. There's someone who needs to be rescued. There's someone who needs to be rescued. So he says in verse nine, even now the ax of God's judgment is poised. It's ready to sever the roots of the trees. And yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. The crowds asked, "Uh uh-oh, I might've added that, but it's in the Greek. (laughs) It's in the Greek there. And you're Greek scholars, so you know this. Lysanias, just remember, Lysanias. That was the word you learned today. What should we do? And John replied, well, if you're gonna allow the rescue, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor because I know you, you're greedy. You wouldn't do it. You need to now. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry because I know you, you don't. You need to now. Even corrupt tax uh, collectors came to be baptized and they asked, teacher, what should we do? And he replied, collect no more taxes and what the government it requires. Just, just do your jobs. What should we do, asked some soldiers. And John replied, don't extort money or make false accusations. Be content with your pay. Why is he saying that? Because they weren't. We need to be. Some of us need a reset. We think the things that are going on in our life are small. But the rescuer wouldn't be pointing them out if they were small. They're being pointed out because it's part of the rescue. And maybe they're not neon sign big, but they're big enough that they're robbing you. And we wonder, why do I lack the peace that's available to me? We wonder, why do I lack the direction that's available to me? Why do I lack the power and the strength of God that is available to me? Why do I lack the freedom that is available to me? Why do I lack the clarity that is available to me? Because of the mess because we ignored the inspector's report because we love this house too much. And we're committed to its condition today and we think it's good enough. And God says, oh, if you only knew how much better it could become if you just allow me to clean this mess up. Otherwise, you are just in a huge distraction and it's preventing you from receiving the redemptive work that the Father wants to bring into your life. And we're left in confusion It's time for confession. It's time for confession. Two challenges today. Two challenges, let's throw that up. That's our last slide. How certain are we that life with Jesus is actually what we want? How certain are you? Your faith is the tell. How much faith you put in Jesus and for your life and the home inspector tells you how much and how certain that you are that you want life with Jesus. How much faith are you exercising for? As James said, hey, demons confess that Jesus is Lord, (laughs) but they don't put their faith in him. So we can be certain, but that's not the same thing as putting my faith in Jesus. 
How certain are we that life of Jesus is what we want? How certain are we that rescue is what we desire? How certain are we that we want the rescue? Or do we come here each time as we gather and we sit each time with God if we do our time in the chair and we think, oh, I'm good. God, you should, you should let me rescue other people. This morning when I got up, I said, God, I'm in need of rescue. And here's what I know. I can't help anybody else find rescue until you've done it in me first. So that was my prayer. And that's the kind of humility I think every one of us need to walk in. I'm not gonna tell you I'm perfect at it because I'm not because I screwed up three days ago and didn't pray that prayer. Thought differently about it. Are we good? My name's Craig. Are we still friends? I love you. I'm not perfect in this, but I'm working at it. It's time to engage your faith and obedience will follow. And I wonder as we're going to a time of, of prayer here, is there something God has asked you to do and you haven't done it? You're just keeping them at arm's length. It's time to clean the mess up. Is there something God's asking you to release? Maybe that's guilt and shame. Maybe it's an addiction. I don't know what it is, but you and him do. Are you gonna keep God at arm's length or are you gonna walk in obedience and do exactly what he's asked? Well, let's find out. Father, we step into your presence now. This is not a closing prayer. This is a moment where we're interacting with you and we're experiencing you and you're here powerfully for us because we've already learned in the gospel of Luke that the person and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit are here and available to do every work that you want to do and to finish it. Father, I know that throughout this message, you've been putting your finger on things Lord, you've been pointing back to that inspection report, things that you really, 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 really want to work on with us. You really, 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 really want to forgive that, heal that, restore that, give freedom for that. Father, that requires me to respond to you. So Lord, I pray that in this moment, for those of us who want to put our faith in you, that we would acknowledge it and ask for your work to be done. If that's you, would you just lift a hand right now before the Lord and say, that's me, God, that's me. That's the work I want done. Craig doesn't know what it is, but I know what it is and you know what it is, God. It's all that matters. Anybody else? Anybody else want to join these in our prayer? So Father, you see our hands, you know what it's all about, you know the, you know the work you wanna do and accomplish. <laughs> On the other side of that, you know the amazing freedom and kingdom of God, cool stuff that we're gonna receive. Lord, I pray that you will empower us with your Holy Spirit now to do exactly what you've asked us to do. To walk in that obedience, to walk at your side and never lose sight. If you're here today and you say, you know what, it's time for me. I want to give my life to Christ. Today's the day. If you're online with us, I want you to just click on the link dropped into the chat right now. You can follow that. If you're here with us presently, I want us to pray this prayer together from your heart. Oh God, it's time. This is time and place. This is latitude, longitude. It's this day, this moment that I choose to give my life to you. I ask that you would forgive me my sin. That you would wash my mind and my heart and begin that cleansing work, oh God. Because it's exactly what this rescue, this victim needs. Lord, I need the rescue. I am bound. But you are the one who will set me free. Lord, I receive that forgiveness today. And I receive the power and the ability to walk at your side with it, the presence of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, O oh God, that along with your presence also comes the incredible gift of the end of the Holy Spirit into eternal life. Lord, it is a, literally a deposit of heaven to come, according to your scriptures. 
So Lord, I thank you that you would receive my heart today. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. If we agree with the prayer, can we say amen? Amen. Amen. The stories that remain. Giving is one of the greatest joys that you and I can experience in life. And I love how we are promised in scripture in the book of Luke, that our gift will return to us in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. It actually says running over. And that's the awesome reason why you can step into giving here at Heights Church. And by supporting Heights Church, you and I have the privilege of stepping into the miraculous work that God is doing in the lives of others. I mean, when we think about it, God is our great provider. He has given us everything that we need. And we get to give a portion of that back so that miraculous work will continue in the lives of others. By giving to support Heights Church, you are actually helping to provide many wonderful opportunities, such as creating a safe place for our kids to learn about Jesus. Yes and bringing students a sense of purpose and belonging through all of our student ministries that we offer here at Heights Church. We get to see people's spirits lifted higher as they engage in our Sunday worship service, either at part of our online campus or here in person. We're actually watching God's word come alive as we learn about its meaning for us today in our Sunday messages. And also we get to open doors for meaningful connections and friendships through our life groups. And we're touching lives overwhelmed by fear, by grief, by addiction and hopelessness. And we are helping to transform them and helping people to experience peace, hope, and joy through the restoration ministries. You and I can leave a legacy literally for eternity as as we see lives changed forever through the church. Will you pray about what God would have you give today? I know that he wants to bring the joy of giving into your life and see lives transformed through you.